Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks, Simon. Um, as my, my name is Neil Herman. I'm the um, fund manager for Henderson Smaller Companies Investment Trust. It's a role I've had for 13 years. Uh, prior to that, I was at Morley Fund Management. Now, I've even invested for 10 years. So 23 years experience in equity markets, um, all in small cap. And I'm going to talk about today um, essentially why I think small cap is an attractive area for your money, uh, why I think growth investment is the way to go, um, and then go through my investment philosophy, how I pick stocks, how I construct the portfolio, and a couple of examples to bring the whole thing to life, hopefully. So first off, um, that's me, sorry. Um, what, why small cap? Why is small cap an attractive area for your money? Um, for me, I think it's about the ability for small caps to produce excess returns compared to large cap over the longer term. Why is that? Almost the view the rule of small or large numbers. It's easier for a company to grow from 10 million profitability to 20 million profitability from more than two to four billion. So doubling from a smaller base is a much easier thing. Why is that? Um, the agility, the flexibility of small caps, um, more entrepreneurial management teams, the ability to access different and niche marketplaces. So essentially, you're going to get a much more diversified, much more kind of ability to look at different areas of particular markets which you can't get in large cap. Um, additionally, within small cap, I believe there's more opportunity for fund managers like myself to add value. Um, if you look at BP, there's probably 40 analysts covering it, producing reams of research. You meet the management team for an hour, what do you really learn? It's too complex a bigger business. In small cap, there's probably two or three analysts covering it less people looking at it. Our ability as fund managers is to do more research, get more underneath the skin of the business, to meet the management team on a more regular basis. Our ability to add value is hopefully more apparent than is for a large cap. Um, and lastly, the numbers don't lie. If you look at it um, over the very long term, so about 1955, if you had 100 pounds and put that into small cap then, it'd now be worth 538,000 pounds, a compound return of over 15% per year over 60 years. And that's outperformed large cap by six and a half times. So small caps over the long term have produced very, very good returns and well in excess of large cap. So that's why small cap. Um, why am I a growth investor? Um, I fundamentally believe that small, well, investing in equities is about growth. It's about the future. My job as an investment manager is to provide capital to companies to be able to grow their business and to provide ability for them to grow their profitability, dividends, cash flow, structure the business overall. Um, it's a way I was trained, where I was brought up. I do believe small caps you should capture that growth, and that's what it's all about. And the key really for me to hear is to find those companies that can not only demonstrate strong growth characteristics, but also re-rate as well. So double whammy of strong growth, but also re-rating. So that's why I'm a growth investor. How do I go about picking stocks and constructing my portfolio? Just to caveat this from a, a total perspective, I said I'm a growth investor. I am a growth investor. However, I'm a GARP investor. A growth at the right price, growth at a reasonable price. Valuation is very important to me. As Joe mentioned earlier about the, um, the tech bubble, that's a time when clearly everyone's lost their collective brains. Um, people paid ridiculous amounts of money for perceived growth. Um, you know, that is a good reminder to us that valuation is very important. You have to pay the right price for the stocks you invest in. So I think vice is a very important component of my investment process. How do, we, how do we buy stocks? How do we find stocks in the market? Now, clearly, small caps, there's a huge universe out there, over 1,000 listed UK small companies. How do I narrow that down to the stocks in my portfolio? Well, in terms of filtering down initially, there's clearly team experience. So I've done the job for 23 years. My colleague, Colin Hughes, for 43 years. A lot of experience there regarding things we like, we don't like, we know we don't like. Um, we also use broker research, you know, very clever people out there, help us filter ideas. But fundamentally, it's about meeting the companies. We see 400 companies a year in my team, all one-to-one, -one, all in our offices, their offices. We have that hour, hour and a half with the management teams to talk about their company, their prospects, their, their business, and how they see things going forward. And we can use that to essentially form the opinion of the business we have overall. And we all meet um, our companies that we invest in at least two or three times a year, have phone calls, conference calls, etc. We get to know them very well over the longer term. Um, what do we look for in the companies that we invest in? Um, I talk about the four M's. Um, these are the four key characteristics I want my companies to demonstrate. So firstly, model. It's business model. It's economic franchise. It's competitive advantage. Kind of Porter's five forces, SWOT analysis of the business. 
Secondly, management. Um, I talk about meeting management teams on a very regular basis. Um, we want to ensure that the management teams we invest in are competent, uh, their track record is very good, the strategy, motivation, vision, corporate governance is always alignment. So it's very important for smaller companies to pick the right management teams. Uh, thirdly is money. By money, I mean balance sheet and cash flow. So a long, long time ago, I was a trained as an accountant. Um, my colleague Indri is also an accountant. Do recognize the quality and strength of balance sheet, uh, which became very apparent during the financial crisis, but also cash flow. Cash flows are probably better long-term true arbiter of value rather than P&L. And lastly, momentum. By momentum, I mean earnings momentum. So that's finding companies that will over-deliver against market expectations. Find the companies that will grow faster than we expect them to do, or the market expects them to do, and that will lead to um, a, a strong share price performance. So those are the kind of quality criteria we look for in companies we invest in. Allied to that, we're being a GARP investor. Valuation is important to us, so they have to be the right price. We're not going to overpay for a company's growth prospects. We have to ensure the valuation we pay is reflective of those growth it, it, um, it, it can generate. Um, portfolio, I mean, unsurprisingly, I'm a bottom-up stock picker. Basically, that's where I add, add value. Um, I'm not a kind of phenomenal, amazing economist. My, my core skill is picking stocks, so I'm bottom-up looking at stocks, meeting company management teams, and investing in visitors. Um, I am long-term. Uh, the average holding period of the companies in my portfolio is five years. So we are investors. We genuinely are not churning the portfolio on a rapid basis. We are looking to invest in the longer term. And allied to these strong buy disciplines, we also have strong sell disciplines. So to ensure that we do capture the returns, and if things change, you get things like deteriorating cash flow or change the management team, we'll look to sell out the stocks that we own. So rather busy slide, let's try to encapsulate my um, process into one page, it's quite difficult, but just think we are growth investors. Valuation is very important to us. We're looking to invest in what we call quality businesses. We're bottom-up stock pickers and we are very long-term. So how would our portfolio look? Um, try to sort of put this into some sort of you know, metrics regarding our, what sort of companies we'd invest in. And I'll come to a couple of examples in particular, but this page on the condensed here, just hopefully gave you an example of what we'd invest in. So it's a kind of a, a, kind of a quadrant here of, of growth, and, growth and value. So we're not going to invest in torpedoes. No one does. Basically, no one's going to invest in those companies that go wrong. It does happen occasionally. I don't get everything right, but it, that's not anyone goes out, sets out to invest in torpedoes. We're not going to be in the value traps, and Joe mentioned that earlier. Um, we're not really, our growth bias means that we're not going to look for those value stocks we think ultimately the returns are kind of quite low and not going to up to our, our degree of um, expectation. We're also not going to invest in the top right-hand part of the uh, quadrant, the expensive but high-growth companies. And to be fair, that's, there's, there's not a reason why we shouldn't look at it. There's some good companies there. Right Move's been a phenomenal success. But fundamentally, the valuation call we make means that the, we believe those companies can be, tend to be overvalued. And that the risk, if they is disappoint or miss expectations, the downside's quite, quite large. So we're going to focus towards the top left part of that page, the companies that are on what you believe to be good, cheap valuations, but growing quickly. Companies like I've mentioned there, Denelm, the furniture retailer, PaySafe, the payments processor, Aldermore, the challenger bank, Sarn, which is a back office provider for um, alternative um, asset managers, and Consult Medical, the um, drug device company. That's what we want our portfolio to be focused towards. So try to bring it into some sort of you know, context of how we do it and give you a couple of examples. The first company I've picked tonight is, um, is Victrex. Uh, Victrex has been part of the portfolio since I joined in 2002. It IPO'd in the mid-90s. I've known the management team since then. Um, been a very successful investment. Um, what does it do? Um, it manufactures an advanced thermoplastic called Peak. Um, developed by ICI back in the, uh, in the 90s. Um, that um, thermoplastic um, is basically used, it's, it's a very lightweight um, material. It's got great durability, flexibility, and resistance to heat. So what it's essentially been used over those years, you can see these applications around here, is being used in industrial applications to replace metal. Um, it's got the same heat characteristics, and by using it, you can essentially reduce weight in cars and planes, for example, and they're more fuel efficient and they're more environmentally friendly. Um, additionally, it's got obviously growth through those areas, but also it's made success in the, in the medical market. So back in the, um, the last decade, um, Victrex started a business called Invibio, uh, which uh, got FDA approval for using peak in the human body for uh, replacement against titanium, for example. 
And there are now over a million people globally with peak implanted in them. It's a very commonly used uh, material in uh, spinal fusion. And Invibio is going from nothing to a 50 million pound business over that time. Um, so generally a very, a very innovative company, a very high growth company, um, a very strong business overall. And how does it go back to kind of fitting our kind of four M's? Um, model, very much so. Um, strong business model, global franchise, gl very high global market share, strong pricing power, strong recurring capital employed. Management team, remarkably consistent. I've known the CEO for um, 20 years. Um, you know, he's a very strong individual, very conservative, uh, managed the business exceptionally well, and his track record is very, very good. Money, balance sheet, uh, 50 million net cash, always had net cash, very sensibly structured balance sheet, very strong cash flow characteristics. You start to get special dividends coming up in the next few years. And momentum, um, I mean, as you see from the chart, it's had a, a, top, kind of a, a slight kind of comeback recently in terms of its share price performance, still very strong over the long term. Um, it's had some issues clearly recently more with um, some of the industrial slowdown we're seeing globally. But longer term, some very strong growth prospects. They're investing heavily in the medical market. So their sales are principally in the spinal fusion market, but they're now looking at the knee, dental and trauma markets, and those could be significant. But also, if you go back, I mean, it's been, the last couple of years, been a big um, use in smartphones as they need to reduce the size and the heat resistance. Um, they're a big supply into Apple, for example, for the iPhone. Um, but also uh, growth opportunities within the, um, um, the um, oil and gas market for pipes um, and also um, in the aerospace market as well. So strong growth prospects in the longer term and very much a core holding of our portfolio. Kind of second company I've kind of uh, chosen as an example of our process and what we look for in companies NMC. Um, NMC is a provider of healthcare services in the um, Middle East, principally the UAE. Um, why is this an attractive business to us? Um, healthcare is generally a growth market overall. It's, um, you know, we're seeing an increasing portion of spend on healthcare. In the UAE, what you're seeing is strong economic growth, but also strong population growth, an ageing population, um, and also under provision of services by both the government and other providers. So a good growth market to grow into. NMC is um, certainly growing quickly at the moment, uh, benefiting from those positive market dynamics, but also from organic expansion. They've opened a couple of new facilities in the last year, a new maternity hospital and a new general hospital. They've also supplemented that um, organic growth by acquisition. So in the last year, they've made four significant deals. They've expanded into the fertility market, so a Spanish um, eugenics business, but also in, in the, in the um, UAE as well but also fleshing out the kind of the credible grave um, operation by buying in long-term care in, in the UAE. So, you know, a, a compelling growth story. Certainly, you know, it's been a very strong performer for us. And again, going back to those four M's, how does it fit? Model, definitely, very much so. Strong growth market, strong dynamics, um, high pricing power, high barriers to entry. Uh, management team, it's still majority owned by the founding family who still run it, so very strong kind of um, track record there, and they're very much aligned with us as shareholders. Money, very cash generative business. It's been investing heavily, both in inorganic and organic opportunities, but nevertheless, still is um, you know, very sensibly structured balance sheet, and cash flow is very good as well. And momentum, it's been a really good momentum story. It's been a fantastic growth um, over the last few years. The share price is obviously up 360% uh, since IPO in, in mid-2012. Um, and it's enjoyed a number of upgrades as we've gone through last year as those actions have kicked in. So NMC, again, top five holding for me, been a great performer. Hopefully will continue to be the case going forward. So a bit of a plug for the product I run. So um, um, I am the manager of the Henderson Smaller Companies Investment Trust. What is it? It's a listed investment trust investing in UK smaller companies. Um, think of any company below about one and a half billion being in my investment horizon. Size-wise, reasonably large and liquid, of half a billion of, um, of gross assets. Um, I'd say a very low fee charge, but I would say that. Um, dividend yield, I mean, one of the things that we do look at the companies we invest in, we are, although we are growth managers um, and we are looking at smaller companies, we like the companies we invest in to have cash flow, to have profits, have dividends. So dividends are important to us as well, and those dividends are paid out to you as a, as a return every year. Um, and obviously we've got some gearing in place which are used to enhance returns. And just in terms of leaving you with a kind of, um, a kind of track record of how we've done over the, um, the, the last um, um, kind of period of, of when I've been in charge. So I joined Henderson in November 2002. This is kind of my track record as fund manager of, of smaller companies. Um, over that kind of 13-year period, uh, the fund has risen by 708%. Um, 
uh, compared to the benchmark of 426. So we've outperformed our benchmark by a pretty material amount over that period of time. So a record that clearly I think myself and the team are very proud of um, and clearly keen to ensure that continues the next 13 years. And just interesting enough, just to look at income flow, which I mentioned earlier about obviously the City of London's phenomenal track record of growing dividends. Um, and I mentioned about the importance of dividends within my investment um, process as well. Um, growth not only gives you growth in earnings and growth in share price, but also the companies I invest in are growing their, growing their dividends as well. They're generating cash flow and profits, and they're giving it back to shareholders. And although the dividend yield on my on the investment trust is only about 2.2, 2.3% it stands today, you can see the sort of growth we've generated in terms of the dividend flow from our, from our business. So if you'd invested a £1,000 when I joined on um, the... 1st of November 2002, that £1,000 today will be now producing an income to you of £169 a year, 16.9% return, um, return on original cost. And clearly, as you can see from this, um, this chart, the aim of this company is to continue to grow its dividend. And with the way we invest and the way we look at growth companies, that's our aim to, to ensure that continues going forward. So, in conclusion, um, you know, Hopefully, I've given you a kind of view as to why I think smaller companies, stuck up as a very viable um, alternative for you as, in, as an investment. Um, hopefully, described how I invest money as a growth investor, but also in terms of the process I go through. Um, and hopefully, by ret the returns we've generated can clearly um, continue going into the future. Thank you for your time. Henderson Eureka Moments. Financial acumen for the wiser investor. Today's bite size insight, gearing. Gearing refers to the mechanism by which an investment trust borrows money, usually from a bank, to make extra investments with the aim of earning a return greater than the cost of the borrowing. To help you understand how it works, let's talk about engines. At its best, the world of finance is a well-oiled machine. But to get ahead, even large financial organizations sometimes need a fuel injection. For example, take an investment trust with a value of £100 million. In an accelerating market, the fund manager sees a road paved with opportunity. But to take maximum advantage, he might want to step up a gear and invest an extra £20 million. Having borrowed the money he needs, the investment trust is now 20% geared. So, the smaller capital value of 100 million has the power to drive a larger 120 million of investable assets. When the market gathers momentum, the investment trust gets an extra boost. On the other hand, if opportunities fail to materialize and market conditions oh, worsen, crumbs. it may increase the losses made. The increasing flexibility of gearing facilities also means fund managers can swiftly remove or reapply gearing depending on market conditions. Terrific. And that's gearing. At Henderson, we believe that knowledge shared is a problem solved. For more expert insights, visit hendersoninvestmenttrusts.com. <laughs> <laughs>